here we go. Yes. Welcome everybody to Afternoon Astonishment. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, here today with us is uh, Steve Barcelona and Aaron Fisher and myself, Adam Grace. We're all excited to watch some magic. What are we going to do today, Aaron? Give us the old intro. All right, let's do it. What's everybody? What's up, everybody? Welcome to Conjure Community. I'm Aaron Fisher. I'm here with Adam Grace, Steve Barcelona, and uh, Alex Slimmer is on assignment. Today, we're going to be looking at two of the greatest masters of the last century. That's Cardini and the great Fred Capps, uh, really both considered to be two of the finest magicians of their, of their entire century. So do us a favor as we get going and click the like button and subscribe to Conjure Community. So you'll be notified every time we go live with a fresh, freshy video. So friends, Fred Capps, Cardini, first thing that comes to mind, which one's your favorite? God, it's tough. It's hard. That, that's a tough one. That's tough. It's weird, right? Because when we think of Cardini, we think of the ultimate perfect manipulation, stage manipulation act. Of a person. With a great character. Well, that's the, I mean, it really all comes together. You know, when we see yeah. even the great Tom Sony you know, we're seeing something that is an echo of Cardini because as you're going to see Cardini, yeah. sure it's black and white and sure it's silent, but you're seriously watching basically a drunken gentleman come home to his flat in London and basically as he's schnackered trying to take off his gloves and get his himself settled, all this stuff happens to him, magic with cards and cigarettes and it's just astonishing how natural and powerful and believable it is. It really just looks like a drunk guy who can't tell if he's hallucinating or not as all this magic is happening. Fred Capps yeah. was you know, considered by many to be the best all around magician yeah. of, of his era. Yeah, definitely. His name was uh, Richard Pitchford. <laughs> he chose right. the name uh, Cardini uh, as his stage name. And, uh, and just in case, you know, you guys uh, aren't aware of this, the Eni, adding the Eni to the end of anything is, was kind of like a magic legacy thing that people did for a long time. So Houdini started it. Well, Randy, doesn't it mean like Randy, you know, the owner of the Genie, the fellow, the tech, the tech mogul who purchased Genie is, is, a, is a Pitchford. And so he's got a family connection. I did not know that. So you were saying, Steve, you were getting back to Robert Houdin and Harry. Yeah, Houdin. that's. I think that's right, isn't it? It's like when you add I to the end of it. In, is it French? Someone check me. It means like. So when Houdini did it, it was like Houdin. Houdin. No. That's, right that's interesting. So like, if I was trying to practice dressing like Adam, I could call myself Gracini. Yes, yeah. exactly. And you would be like Grace, which would mean you had no grace. So you know, I don't know. If you or you could be Vernini. If you were Bernini, Bernini then you could you, be Bernini. Yeah, Bernini. Right. As opposed to, you know, well, little Gaffis. Little, you know? <laughs> Lomini. That doesn't quite work. What was that? Lomini? That's like Bar little. Lo Lomini. Yeah, Lomini. Right. Okay. So what do we got queued up first? I think we decided, do we want to start with Cardini or do we want to start yeah. with Tap? Yeah, let's start with Cardini because this is a really famous, if you've never seen this, this is a real big treat for you today. This is the performance of Cardini uh, when he, now he was, this was in 1957, okay? And he was 62 years old when he appeared on one of the very few magic television shows that are still in existence to this day uh, that show any footage of Cardini. This might be the only one, but it's called the Festival of Magic. And it's a very famous uh, bit of footage of the entirety of Cardini's act. So. The in giant book that was written about Cardini was, was taken not only from Cardini's own, own notes and, and all the work that was studied about him, but they studied this exact footage that you're about to see frame mm -hmm. for frame. Yeah. This is the act in its most full sense. Yeah, it is. All right, let's check it out. Uh, here we go. Let me just cue this up. I think you guys are going to love this, especially if you've never seen it before. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Good example of what the very best in the universe would look like if you could see it. All right, can you see that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess. And so to me. Oh, 
Yeah. Just a couple of things. He's wearing his gloves, right? Yes. You know that story, right? Real quick, I want to hear the story. The first thing I want everyone to just know is I believe that that page boy there was Swan, Mrs. Cardin. Right? I'm not sure, but I believe mm -hmm. so. Second, he's doing those card productions with gloves on, y'all. It's just mm -hmm. a level of skill which people can't even fathom. So what's the story? So if I'm not mistaken, the reason why he can, can do it with gloves is because he was in the trenches in World War I, I believe, and was practicing card manipulations in the trenches wearing gloves because it was freezing. And that's how he practiced. And so that gave him that ability to do that. Really interesting. Benny Haney, who was a great another veteran, vision, yeah. and he did three tours of duty in Vietnam, and he was in some very sticky stuff. But he was another guy that would practice in his foxhole, literally, mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. I mean, just for anyone who's ever learned how to do card productions, the idea of doing those in gloves. Adam, you used to be a manip artist. Did you get very far in your attempts to do it in gloves? I remember I tried only a couple of times. It is not you. You don't have you don't have the feel. I mean, you really need to be able to feel every of every nerve in your fingers to be able to do really great back palms and card productions. So. I can't, I can, I can say I never had any success with gloves on. Uh, yeah, it's got to be impossible. Quick, just to take, I'm just curious. Let's take a quick poll in the chat. Put a one in the chat. If you're not even familiar with the idea of how to produce a fan of cards from your hand, because it's the kind of thing, Adam, where if you were almost able to just snap one or two cards out and let people see what that is. Yeah. You'd then when you start to see how he's making these fans of cards appear out of nowhere, the absolute improbability of anyone being able to do such a thing, I think almost makes it even better. Steve, were you going to give us a little demo? It looks like if there's some ones in there. Why don't you show the people? Well, Adam did a whole training on this in the back room. Yeah, I, I just want to give the people- I gave a away the skill because when I do that, that finger locks. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> I yep. can't, but I used to be able to do it. So that's one card. So now imagine being able to do that with a whole fan. And of course the idea of the split fan is being yeah. able to, under this beautiful cover of being able to dump the cards out, you can really just dump a few of those cards out while the rest go back. Just, I mean, I don't know if you can walk people through just the visual of what that is. Um, I can grab some cards and do it. I don't have a deck right here. I think if people could see it, I mean, I can, I, this is a total fresh year, just be so wrong to do. But just the principle, if you have a big fan, and then as you throw, yeah. you keep them i'm not gonna i'm not gonna snap them back there right and then you can continue doing it you do it several times because when just a few fall out of your hand it really looks like a bunch now as we head into the next bit think about that and this man in gloves because i can give you a hint folks you try that same thing in white evening gloves and you're gonna find it doesn't work at all because it's hard Empty hand, yo. Smaller. <laughs> Amazing.
Out of his shoe. Yeah, yeah, it was some great misdirection there. Yeah, that was really great. You know, you're going, you're going to go on to see that, like, when when we watched like Lance Burton and you know some of the modern day like car manip guys, like they they took the choice pieces from Cardini's act. You know, every bit that they could pour it over, they did. Yeah, yeah, those choice pieces though, uh, they like like the appearance of two fans and the disappearance of one of them. Mm -hmm. uh you know the certain the just very specific things out of cardini's act everything that you could say was in tarbell is in tarbell yeah you know one mm -hmm. other interesting thing his character is so clear that in the old books you used to see pictures of the new york guys hanging out you'd see cardini and vernon and the guys hanging out but cardini was always hard to spot because he didn't look like his character at all he's just a dude hanging out with a smile on his face and you basically got this monocled gent, this loaded monocled gent with his face on. And, and whenever you see him at rest, he doesn't look like this guy, right? As we get started here, George Madrid has been very clever to note. I think we all love the set piece of the drunk sleeping man in the hotel. Yes. Let's fire it back up. All right, let's do it. There it is. Let's see if we get the little cover from the white stuff. This is the kind of thing you can do if you do the glove thing, you can take off the glove. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> you know and and to like that that single card production definitely too hard to do with a glove on i think even cardini realized he had to save that for when he took the glove off mm -hmm. yeah and, good that's a good notice right there yeah yeah and we're one third of the way through his act so i would say it's safe to say he's got a structure here and he has just done the card sequence where he took off the gloves and then he did that that big finish with the single productions in the thing, right? Yeah. Very curious if you look at it that way. We'll see what's next. I'm sure all the great manipulation artists of all time have diagrammed this thing down to the moment. That's that guy. Ah. Now it's time to smoke. <laughs> Adam, what's happening there? Is that a... <laughs> so it's the cigarette holder and the cigarette. What's happening with the monocle? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gone right now. That whole sequence, we could just watch it over. It yeah, quick. I mean, that's just amazing what went on right there. Yeah. Back. Let me back it up a little bit. Yeah, and help talk you through what's happening in the first hit. Yeah, it's it's so core it's so well choreographed that it's it's hard to even follow even as a magician like it's hard to follow I, uh, steve i said i think what's going to happen is he's going to vanish the cigarette right and then it appears back in the cigarette holder mm -hmm. but intermingled in all of that is the vanishing of the monocle right that seems like yeah. What's going on? yeah the cigarette holder is vanishing, the cigarettes vanishing, they're changing places and the monocle keeps disappearing and he can't keep up with any of it. Yeah. Right, I'm just trying to get cig people, at what point it vanishes and what- Yeah, it's hard yeah. to see because of the tape, but the really cool thing here is the cigarette holder. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and how that whole thing is constructed. It's very clever. It is. Right. See if you guys can get anything more clear that we can point to it in terms of-
cigarette. Gone. Now he's got a cigarette holder. There he puts that in there, and we're gonna smoke. There's his monocle, and it was immediately gone. Now it, it, it literally vanished immediately. And I think maybe he's dropping on the tank when he goes to look at it. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the monocle is literally just tied to that chain. And, and he's shocked by the appearance and he goes to look at it and it drops. And it falls out. I don't think it so much vanishes. I think yeah. you're right, Aaron. A bit. Okay, so, and but it is vanishing out of the holder and yeah. appearing back in the holder. And he's using yeah. his eye business to highlight that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you know, the thing is, you don't really ever see the monocle drop because he's got it so well choreographed too that it almost looks like it's disappearing. Looks like it's disappearing, but it's actually just sort of a freebie, right? Yeah. Let's take it back one more time and see if we can, uh, you know, because then there's that one where he jams it in his ear. Yeah. And I think it's appearing right in the, in the cigarillo tip there, isn't it? It is, yeah. So then there's two for a second there, right? Oh no, it vanished back, yeah. There it is. Uh, lit match just vanished from hand to hand fight yeah it did right yeah right and again it's so beautifully choreographed that he went to strike it and it was gone and lit in his other hand mm -hmm. yeah. jump back yeah it's quite uh little magic you know what mm -hmm. i mean it's very powerful but it's also very little We've also, we've talked for the, over the years about how useful it can be when you can't have an object to look at to the right or left to draw someone's focus, how it can be very useful to, you know, you've got a thing here and you can, you know, yeah. you push up your glasses. But he's using that monocle as a whole universe mm -hmm. of, of justification right. for everything, putting mm -hmm. it in, taking it out, like reacting to whatever just happened with it. He's, he can use it to cover anything. So let, let's take it one more time. Let's watch those jumping lit matches. There's aspects of this routine, y'all, I have to admit that having you here to help me is making it so much easier for me to take it in moment to moment. It's so much uh, better with friends. We run it back. <laughs> yeah, so he's just trying to get his cigarette lit. That's the premise. <laughs> So what happened? That's it vanished. That's what yeah, happened. That just kept disappearing, yeah. Oh. I think he might have this. Yeah, he had a palm, like a thumb pad written that. Here we go. Boom. Oh, 
this is so good to get a cutaway. Five entries, huh? Serious ashtrays back in the day. Yeah. Back in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Need a good reel. Energy just oh. thinking the exact same thing yep yeah totally but you hadn't thought it before now right i had not no but you are now right i am yes yeah just to tell everybody what we're thinking like like late era mullica with his cigarette act like there's the, the 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 very first crumbles of innovation are right here in cardini's act for a lot of what mullica was doing in his very famous cigarette act there's suspense faces and the reaction to the cigarette being where it shouldn't be and your face. Yeah, I think this is really great. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> oh, it's in your eye. <laughs> Who likes to smoke? <laughs> that was why that guy said. <laughs> awesome. on, don't, you feel, don't, you, don't you feel like standing and applauding? I have a couple thoughts about that that I think are interesting. One, it's like everything in that act pretty much he, he practiced in the foxhole, everything, not just the cards. It's mm -hmm. all stuff you could just have in your pockets, you know? And that really there, I would argue, is the first step to what we expect modern magic to be now. 
It's not just the trick. It's everything that's layered on top of it. You know, it's the character. It's what's happening in this moment. It's, you know, it's not just simply the trick. You know, it's, it's the play. It's what goes on above it. So I think that was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, I, you know, I it's hard to say because you're you're definitely like the the drunk the stuff where he's inebriated is definitely more heavy in the first part of Cardini's act, mm -hmm. and I guess it's because he really needs to establish that that's what's going on. But it, dude, that I mean, the manipulation of the balls, the cigarettes, unbelievable the pipes. I mean, all of it is so unbelievable uh, that. Uh, it's it's even hard to I mean the man was in his in his uh, mid sixties when he was performing that and so I mean it's hard to ever imagine I would have an act that good that's all I'm saying like yeah how really many years would it take to choreograph something that unbelievably good better than that how many times would you have quit on that act and started something new <laughs> right I mean that's what you're seeing there's a lifetime of work for that yeah. nine minutes right there a lifetime you would have quit work. ten times over course not even fair to say a lifetime of work because a lifetime of work won't get that for you unless you have no. to be this guy and you know Agreed. the only thing that isn't the only thing that is big about the act is his energy and how he plays it it is really truly a billiard ball it's not even a multiplying billiard ball routine he's using no. it as a single object transpositions appearances disappearances and then some beautiful stuff to watch which is really interesting because he's really playing this drunkard thing and it's almost as you're watching it in any clip, you might think, oh, maybe he made a mistake there because there's room for him to make mistakes because it, the whole thing is a mistake. None of it's supposed to be happening. So there's right. a lot of times where it looks like, you know, this wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't supposed to happen. Of course, it's all part of the character. Um, but, you know, then he's got this huge interplay with it that really makes it play. At the end, he throws away his cigarette twice because he doesn't want to take one. Turns out that's because he wants a pipe. And then for the very last bit, he'd rather have your pipe. He snakes this guy's big Sherlock pipe and leaves, right? Now, Craig Katz certainly worked on stage. I'm very curious to see, because Craig Katz was known for close-up and stand-up and really just so much perfect stuff, almost like Vernon's corollary uh, on the world stage. And I wonder, Adam, what's our first piece to watch there? Well, we actually only are going to watch one one piece, and it's it's similar because we what we've got is we've got we found Caps's stage act, his actual. Uh, you're right, Mystic. He's just pure class, and this this act shows it. Uh, Caps on stage is fantastic, and this uh, this clip that we're going to watch is a pretty famous. Um, routine of his and it's called the sleeveless routine but um but you'll see why you'll see why i don't want to ruin it so why don't we just jump in and watch it cats did a lot of stuff yeah he really did all right let me uh share this and here we go Yeah. Take yeah. care. Take care.
they cut away <laughs> that that just right when the great vanish happened. Yeah, Un right. Un that was cut. bad live editing at its worst. Yeah. Notice how quick this act is moving. I mean, it started with that cane thing, but things are picking up here. He understood the significance of fire. That wallet. Ooh, flash cat. I've never seen it by. Did you not? Big old coin and some bills, right? Yep. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. Like yeah, here, here's the finale. Oh, right here. Oh, oh, here it comes. Goodness. You catch that? That was awesome, right? Watch mm -hmm. that. Watch this. Just back it up like just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll turn the volume off. I mean, this is this is this production here at the end, and then watch. I mean, boom, 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 thrown away, thrown away, thrown away, and they no, cut they away. Cut away. Oh. Look at that! Oh, look at that look at steel. That. that steel was perfect. And watch the box. Boom, and that's it. Great little cue cue points there. All of, all of it's really great. Every time he's throwing those coins away through that whole sequence, it really feels like they're going away. Mm -hmm. So once you just sort of get to the point where you understand that when he's throwing them away maybe he's not throwing them away <laughs> yeah realize like what's you know these stuff looks so magical in both of these guys it looks so magical you're likely not to think there's anything skillful happening because it's just happening and it's only like it's like when we were saying about talking about what a split fan is it's only once you have a little bit of an idea of what's happening that the actual intensity of how amazing what the guy is doing is begins to be clear to you. Maybe that's what it is for magicians, though. I, I can't even wait to see what's next in the sleeve. The skill track. level is just off the chart. You know what's it's weird to me, Steve? Like it's not weird because we've we've come to like uh, understand it, appreciate it. But like this idea that uh, a guy gets on stage, music gets turned on, there's music, and then he just starts doing stuff, right? Like, I'm just going to, you're going to watch, you as an audience, you're going to watch me do stuff. And I'm going to fumble around, not fumble around, but I'm going to yeah, yeah, yeah. play with coins first. And I'm going to do things with those, a little of this, a little of that. It's just an interesting concept because it, it's it's not really participant. You know, the, the audience doesn't really participate. They just watch. And that so style of magic. You know, it, it has uh, it comes straight down through even my mentor Frank Brintz. I mean, that is how a lot of people approached uh, approached performing on stage. So let me throw out my idea here, and you guys can 
pick it apart. Back, especially now, it's like you're watching this. There were a lot of spots available for guys to do 10 minutes and get paid, right? Supper clubs, nightclubs, variety shows. It, like now, if there's a variety show, it's in Vegas, really, right? There are no variety shows in New York. But in the, but in the 40s through the 60s, there were a lot of nightclubs that had shows, singers. And so there's a lot of opportunity for an act like this, for an act where you could walk on in front of the bandstand and the band would play some music and then you just, you know, do what you do. And if I'm not mistaken, and I'm going out on a limb here, I don't think stand-up comedy was as popular in the 40s and 50s as it became in the, in the late 60s, uh, where when you think about entertainment now, there's only three kinds of entertainment for any person really, which is an actor, a comedian, or a musician. You know, they don't think really past that as far as entertainment very much anymore. So I think that's where you have this act that exists in this bubble, right? The band's going to play some music. You just come out and do some stuff when the band takes a break kind of thing. You have 10 minutes, you know, and that's where the 12 minute dove act comes from. Right? Yeah, it, it, it is. You're right. You're right. I mean, yeah, all those so, so, on 12 minutes, it's perfect for that. It's really flashy. Everybody can see it and you, you have to do it immediately. You can't like load up your dove act and wait three hours. <laughs> right. You have to right. do it. Right. You know? Yeah. So it's perfect for that. And that's where it comes from. So I know I'm doing all the blabbing today. So I think the, the, the other two interesting things. One, he feels no obligation to perform to the music. The music is just happening in the background. He's not punctual. He's just performing. I was going to ask you guys, is there any chance that that was his music? Or is that literally give me something up tempo, boys? Yeah. No, totally what that is right. Like, like, yeah. he, like my, my mentor, Frank, Frank Brintz, he, he worked the cruise line industry towards the end of his career and he didn't care what music was used. I mean, it was just whatever you got guys, you know, make it up tempo and jazzy. I mean, that was his request. And then some come with their own sheets. Some magicians would go with their own sheets that give to the band and be like, this is my music. We get the impression that Cardini's act was not that at all. No, right? that was his exact music. Yeah. So here's the thing. Whenever I see this Fred Caps with, with the cane, it just bothers me so much because I thought to myself, if I ever came upon that problem, right, which is we all know what's going on. It's a Walsh vanishing cane, you know, classic in the newspaper. And, you know, there's a reason we're going for the magic wiffle dust, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to expose it, but we all know why we're going for the magic I wiffle dust. We all know what a Walsh vanishing cane is. Do you not? No, I don't. It's never been part of my thing. Okay, well, that's, but that's what it is. But anyway, his solution is I'm going to go to my pocket for the magic salt. Right. <laughs> right. Which I don't think I could ever. Oh, I like, that. I, like, I like the salt. And when he does it, it's, it works. Patassi you know? used to use it all the time too. And who did? Patassi, Paul Patassi. Oh yeah. Did he? Yeah. But I used to think probably it was because, you know, his name was like Potassio. Yeah. Potassium, yeah that's right. That, now that makes sense. <laughs> you can yeah. explain that away. <laughs> I always used to think that, you know, I mean, I think the whole thing is so whimsical. I think once you're on yeah. making jumbo coins appear from a piece of silk, right? I feel like once you're in that space, taking a magical salt shaker and pouring it on top does not strike me as a major leap from the- <laughs> you're, You might be it's right. It's interesting as an opener though, like it, yeah. You know? just to come right out of the gates like that, I think is really interesting. I let's, think it's let's, interesting. Let's press on. Let's press on. Here we go. Okay, Greg. Oh, e right into it. Okay. All right, then. <laughs> sorry, it's a little extra there. What the? Wait a second. I'm sorry. I'm I love the metaphor here. 
gets the van going again. <laughs> it's so great. I like how he's trying to get out of his other hand. Great. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> I don't know what's about this lady. I feel like that lady might be the Queen of Holland or something. She's the groupie. You guys are really seeing how the salt stick works now. Oh. I don't think that's his wife because she wouldn't be clapping. She's seen him a thousand times. She'd be like, is he done yet? <laughs> Isn't that's that like, great? Yeah, that's isn't that great. Isn't that incredible? Wasn't that great? Yeah. That's a it's 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 really great. Like that, I I've seen someone else do that. That still not steel or yeah steel. I guess use that that caps, uh, uh sort of salt gimmick. Yeah, that use that exact thing where you know the salt won't quit coming out of their hand, and he's trying to hide it in his pockets and get rid of it it's really funny and and i i wish i could say i thought of that what you know thought of that because I, I think it's just a brilliant uh little bit and and it looks so magical and it's it's pretty amazing uh, i was just gonna say richard dean says that's his wife yeah and she's still clapping she we was... were talking recently about the uh about how all the guys started doing the swallowing a balloon trick the sword swallowing with the balloon and we we're talking about how small it is how big it plays and while it's got a certain look to it, which isn't for me, and you know, it's not for a lot of folks, but it's for it. If you're looking around trying to figure out what you can take out and do in your show that actually fits like how much you can carry with you at all, you start opening your mind to the things and saying, well, could it be? Anyway, you know, could it be for me? And you know, the salt pour is sort of the most lovely example in the universe of a trick because you know, it just looks like a lot more salt is coming out at one moment than it is. And it allows you to make it go as long as you can. And that can be quite a good long time. But talk about a trick that is so wonderful. I mean, it's a little harder than that balloon trick to do. But man, is it a trick that really plays huge. You know, you can really see it. Yeah. I was, Adam, do you, do, have you ever heard this? Uh... I was told by an old timey magician that the secret to that is popcorn salt. Have you ever heard that? No, I haven't heard that. It's different than like your regular iodized salt. It's more flaky. Mm -hmm. So you can really pack the, the gimmick. And I think you still have to really get it down. I mean, there's a lot of. Oh, there's a lot of, there's a lot, lot more to it than just that. Yeah, it is. It would be very fine. I mean, because you're definitely controlling like the valve is your pinky, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. So what's, what's interesting, because because I've played around with the salt pour, too, and there's a few different ways that you can do it. But, uh, you know, his his vanish. I mean, that that vanish that he does when he vanishes mm -hmm. salt is just brilliant handling. He's got to turn his body. And I don't know, but it looks like to me that he has to turn his body so he can get the the yes. game is turned around the right way, right? In his hand, because he's kind of he's got to reposition it. But that that controlling of the pour is is the pinky. And so you don't really know when it's gonna end. I mean, there's no there's no buzzer inside that's yeah. gonna beep when it's got 10% uh, left. Actually, I don't know if you know this, but there's a new one out now with an LED, so you can tell when it's about to I'm Are just you kidding. Curious? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I wouldn't put it past it, you know. It's one of those, these tricks are like those, these particular tricks, they're almost like zero satisfaction to practice them at home watching TV. They're, they're like practice light, rehearsal heavy. Yeah. Like yeah. the whole thing, you got to be up on your feet in a rehearsal space working for a living. You know, they're, that's why they're not tricks for amateurs. You know what I mean? I mean, then you got to like load, you got to have the bucket of salt in your rehearsal space. You're always loading in the bucket of salt so you can practice your salt and then dumping it into the bucket so you can reload. You already got that room in the back of your house where you know that anyone goes in there is going to get a terrible disease from the birds. Yeah. <laughs> the room is already like set up with the bird smell and everything. At least there's a lot of, you know, it's really, you want to start like serial murder and stage manips. You really want to consider having a drain and a slightly 
you know, a slightly <laughs> angled floor so that you can just do a lot of drainage stuff in there. You know what I mean? You just hose the place down. That's right. You know, you really need need to be set up for certain kinds of industrial grade murder and stage magic. <laughs> well, you can like Airbnb it for that other purpose. Oh yeah, but you're gonna need to practice more than that. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you're gonna have to be. You're gonna be going through a lot of salt before you start thinking. Let me throw it into my show. Now, <laughs> when you meet a person that's like, ah, I learned the salt pour. I've really been working at it this week. I'm gonna put it up next week. It's gonna be great. And you're like, hmm. I wonder how you've got it down to practice it so efficiently. Same with that egg bag. You remember when we were with Scott Alexander? Fred mm -hmm. Caps is like another, egg bag you guy. know, egg bag guy, right? One of the ones you want to see in all the world. You're dealing with a fellow that could take these classic simple tricks, which are not simple in the slightest. They're actually so not simple that it takes 10 years of practicing with them before you begin to realize how not simple they are. You know what I mean? Another 10 before they start to come together. You know, Fred Caps was like this with everything. And that's what he was known for time and time again is the level of detail that would go into any single effect he did. Well, not only that, even his own name. I mean, his his actual name wasn't Fred Caps. It was a Abraham Bongers. And really? Yeah. I mean, and he uh, he's a Dutch magician. And Fred Caps chose... Uh, the name Fred Caps because he wanted uh, he wanted an, a last name that would sound crisp in any language that it was said because he performed all over the world. So he chose the word Caps because no matter what language you spoke, it really pops out there, right? Like clear view, but more concise. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So, so so this is a guy. If you want to learn more about Fred Caps, just know he's a three time FISM winner. He was a Grand Prix FISM winner three times. Yeah, which is not easy. And uh, and if you want to look up some of Fred's other really, really famous uh, illusions that he did, check out the dancing and floating cork. That mm. is a, a, a renowned Caps trick throughout the world. Everybody loved that. Um, great, just great magician. I, 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 I would say I can't believe we have not uh, featured him yet because... He is one of the masters. He is, and he's a European. And it's one of the things where, by and large, the Europeans are more intimately acquainted with his work in the same way we are here with Vernon in the United States. You know? It's well, guys, appreciate you uh, guys joining us today for Afternoon Astonishment. Uh, we're going to... We're going to wrap it up here, but do us a favor, hit the like button on this video and follow us. That tells everybody we're doing a good job on these videos and come check out Conjure Community Club. We're a pretty good magic club. <laughs> pretty good. We're my favorite. <laughs> it's my sure. favorite magic club. Yeah. Sure would, be nice to, sure would be nice to have you join our club, Conjure Community Club. Come check it out. All Ooh. right. Right on. Yeah. We'll see you uh, tomorrow night for uh i believe slight night so don't miss that and um for the rest of you guys we'll see you on thursday